It's the second time in two years Boeing workers at William Town feel they've been let down by their employer. In 2006, 25 went on strike for nine months against the company's plan to introduce individual contracts. Now 200 aeronautical specialists are facing the axe, following Boeing's loss of a Defence Force contract to maintain the RAF's FA-18 Hornets. The Australian Workers Union says the redundancy package workers are being offered is disappointing they're running true to form. Um, they're a huge multinational that I think are, are far too arrogant um, to be running businesses in a, in a decent employer sort of uh, region like the Hunter. The Defence Force tender has gone to BAE Systems, the company responsible for building the base's Hawk lead-in fighters. The union is now calling on the Australian government to act on workers' behalf. I can assure you that uh, the government and the Defence Department don't want to lose any of the skilled uh, workers who've been involved at Williamtown and that's why we're encouraging uh, Boeing and BAE to cooperate as closely as possible. Madeline Bond, NBN News. It can be difficult finding a park at one of the state's busiest hospitals. Even getting into the car park can be tricky. From next week, the prices are going up at the majority of Lower Hunter hospitals in a bid to ease the squeeze on spaces. We're not budgeting an in increase in revenue from these changes. Belmont, Maitland, Walls End and Waratah will have a flat $4 daily fee, the same as James Fletcher. But timed parking is being introduced at the John Hunter's Rankin Park campus. For shorter stays of two hours or less, parking is actually cheaper under the new proposal and for longer stays that will increase. Up to $10 for a day. I think it's absolutely disgusting, hard enough to get a park as it is, never mind have to pay extra fees. And they're coming here either as patients or as visitors or the staff and a lot of socially disadvantaged groups have to use this hospital. Uh, because I can't get parking at John Hunter. About 90 people use the shuttle bus from here at EAS to the John Hunter every weekday. It's hoped the increased parking fees will encourage more of the 8,000 people who compete for less than 3,000 spots each day to use the shuttle. Penny Evans, NBN News. Despite our strong mining sector, the hunter isn't immune to the world economic turmoil. But there is some hope, with interest rates expected to tumble, first home buyers given a boost with increased grants, while current employment is up 4.5% in the region. The labour market is holding up surprisingly well. It's, it's really quite strong. Jobs have been shed, but not a huge amount. The bad news, analysts believe unemployment will rise next year with weakening sales and demand, leading firms to start reducing overheads by laying off workers. Australia's unemployment rate will jump from 4.3 to 6 per cent by late 2009, according to the National Australia Bank's chief economist. Speaking to business people at the Hunter Valley Research Foundation breakfast in Newcastle today, Alan Oster predicted the Australian dollar will stay around the 68 US cent mark until early 2009 and recover to about 75 US cents by late next year. And his tip on interest rates, the Reserve Bank will continue to cut. We think they're going to do 50 basis points in November and by early next year uh, I think they'll be down another 50 points. By middle of June I think probably around about 4.5%. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. She's played on the biggest stages in the world, but Jets captain Cheryl Salisbury admits she's as excited as her teenage teammates about this weekend's clash with Canberra United. The legendary Matilda thought lift-off for this group of Jets might never happen. I had been holding my breath for a long time and um, I was starting to go a bit blue in the face. It's good to finally see that it's happened and that we've got a league running again. I think we've still got a long way to go. Coach Gary Phillips says the squad has had a limited preparation. I think initially it's going to be tough for every team. I don't think a lot of coaches know their own teams, to be honest, because there's players coming from interstate to join different teams and I don't think any team's going to be set up for three or four weeks. Each player has a unique story, with most making sacrifices to be here. Well, I've decided to do Pathways, which is HSE, over two years, just so I could 
have a balance between soccer and school and just do well in, hopefully do well in, in both. Stacey Day moved from Adelaide to join the Jets. I'm 19, had to, didn't have to, but I moved out of home, just I needed a challenge. Sammy Wood hails from a tiny New South Wales country town and like most of the girls in the league will have to adjust to the new era of professionalism. I went from training pretty much nothing to training every day so yeah my body's adjusted to it pretty well. The Jets start their W League campaign at Broadmeadow at 1.30 on Sunday. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. Having hosted six meetings in the rain already this year, today's sunshine was a welcome relief for the Newcastle Kart Club. The fine tuning had already begun at the Cameron Park track this morning, as the best drivers from the eastern states prepare to do battle for the Newcastle City Cup. We've got Steele Juliana here, who's a, a multiple international champion, races in Europe for Team PCR, uh, and multiple state champions as well, uh, Nathan Sinclair, Joshua Buggy. Racing begins tomorrow morning at 8.30. To golf and despite holding this chip shot for birdie on the 15th during the first round of the Arizona PGA Tour event, Ellie Barner's Nick Flanagan still sits eight shots off the pace and is in danger of losing his tour card. Onto the water, an Irish yacht Green Dragon with Lake Macquarie sailor Tom Braidwood on board today became the first boat to cross the first scoring gate off the Brazilian coast in the Volvo Around the World Ocean Race. Fellow Lake Macquarie sailor Chris Nicholson crossed third on board Puma Racing. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. It appears that he's stumbled at the curb edge and fell out into the oncoming path of a southbound vehicle. Um, as a result, he was uh, fatally injured. They weren't pulling the rail line up in Newcastle today, instead undertaking maintenance work, maybe to ensure the embattled stretch of track can sustain the latest attack on its existence. Renowned architectural columnist Elizabeth Farrelly is another person on board the plan to stop the train at Wickham. She says an inner city transport hub would better connect the CBD with the beach and harbour. And now that Newcastle's you know, focus on industry is changing, it seems to me that that's probably a good moment to do what's been talked about for so many decades. 
Federal Charlton MP Greg Combe chaired a meeting with GPT, Newcastle MP Sharon Grierson and Anthony Albanese this week to discuss whether the project would come under the umbrella of the government's new major cities unit. He says government shouldn't be choosing where the track stops. Ultimately, uh, you know, the views of the community about it all I think will be the decisive factor. GPT will come out of a trading halt on Monday and Sharon Grierson wants to make sure the company is honest with the community if it's in financial strife. That they do uh, make sure that's known uh, and that they don't try to use uh, planning or lack of planning or lack of infrastructure as an excuse and I'm not at all suggesting that that is the case. Penny Evans, NBN News. My body's breaking down day by day. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult. So if I just back off a little now and, and take the time, we'll definitely make it there, that's for sure. It's no wonder Jets goalkeeper Ante Kovic was tired this morning. He was certainly made to work last night, withstanding a muscled-up Mariners in the F3 derby at Gosford. In attack, the Jets just couldn't convert chances, while it wasn't the case for the hosts as Dylan McAllister made good a magic Matt Simon cross. The Griffiths twins helped service Edmundo Zura while guest jet Mark Milligan also provided options in his 70 minutes. He'll be much better for, for that run and we've got a longer week, we can get some more work into him. There'll be work up front too and while Zura did deliver from out wide, his coach would like to see more of him in the box. We're looking at, at Zura playing more central and being the person who's going to be on the receiving end of crosses rather than him being the provider of the crosses. Newcastle continued the chase, but the equaliser never came as the Mariners move into the top three. Helicopters, trail bikes, fire trucks, authorities threw everything at the muster. Over the weekend, police, the Rural Fire Service, Fire Brigade, National Parks and other stakeholders scoured bushland in the Lake Macquarie and Cessnock Council areas. More than 70 people were involved in the offensive known as Operation Blackbird. Operation concept design, or driven by the Department of Premiers and Cabinet and it's designed around addressing the illegal use of public land. Um, it's a multi-agency approach. It's Catching illegal trail bikers and keeping an eye on motorbike riders a top priority. The uh, education aspect to uh, the social trail bike riders in there, that they require registration and insurance, they require licences for that type of vehicle. Unfortunately, the most common fine dumped asbestos and household rubbish. Dangerous not just to the bush, but for emergency service personnel heading into the fire season. This operation bigger than previous events. It's just grown a little bit and it's encompassing a, a lot more in relation to bushfire and arson attacks and malicious damages. Authorities are promising more crackdowns in coming months. Penny Evans, NBN News. For women's football, this moment has been a long time coming and certainly worth capturing, but it was a forgettable start for Newcastle when Canberra's Sasha McDonald scored in just the second minute. 
It sparked something in the hosts, though, their attack spearheaded by Emily Van Egmond and Katie Gill. Jets keeper Alison Logue was never troubled and neither were her strikers. Gill giving her all to score the equaliser, Newcastle's first W League goal. Canberra's Cara Mowbray couldn't hit the spot, while Jet Joanne Peters showed her class to keep Newcastle on target. Katie Gill pushed for a second right on the break while Canberra couldn't break the deadlock either. The girls gave their all with plenty of running battles while the goalkeeping war was won by Logue. The match winner came late, the legwork done by Nicole Jones, giving Gill her double. Newcastle now travels to play Adelaide on Friday. Commissioned by the Urban Task Force and prepared by BIS Shrapnel, the report is the property development industry's take on Tilligra. It's proposed that 60% of the costs of Tilligra Dam be paid for by a new tax on development. That's $251 million in new taxes. The Urban Task Force claims it had crippled the industry. Hunter Waters says the issue of who should pay is understandably contentious. We've had submissions saying that 100% of Tilligra Dam should be paid for by growth, the Urban Task Force say 0% should be paid for by growth and Hunter Water's submission is saying that there should be an equitable split. The report also reignites debate about who will benefit from the dam, claiming despite Hunter Water's assertions to the contrary, Tilligra is about drought proofing the central coast. What's fair is that everyone who benefits from the Tilligra dam pays for it equally. That's the central coast what water pays and the Hunter Water pays. At the moment we're allowing no contribution from the Central Coast and therefore no benefit to the Central Coast from Tilligra. And the Central Coast doesn't want a bar of it. There's absolutely no need for it, so why would we impose a levy on our ratepayers for something that they absolutely don't need? The pricing regulator is currently looking at costings for the dam. Tank Paddock covers 150 hectares of land near Minmai. The coal and allied owned site is the last significant parcel of land needed to create a green belt between the Watican Mountains and Stockton Beach. For a decade, the Green Corridor Coalition has lobbied Newcastle City Council and the state government to protect the land from being developed. Two years ago, the coalition thought they'd won their fight when the mining giant signed a memorandum of understanding with the state agreeing to hand over the land as long as it was allowed to develop other areas. But that still hasn't happened. It's still in the hands of the state government but it's likely to come back to the council which is not what has been promised. The coalition is now calling on state planning minister Christina Keneally to take action where her predecessors have failed. We want the, the tank paddock rezoned um, irrespective of anything that Coal and Allied is negotiating with the government. The group says the rezoning would be a step closer to getting the land included in the National Parks Estate. Christina Keneally was unavailable for comment. Madeleine Bond, NBN News.
Ian Bradford was found floating in Cockle Creek near the Five Islands Bridge by a passing cyclist in the early hours of the 5th of May 2006. His de facto Anne Baker and a former girlfriend were among those attending today's hearing before Deputy State Coroner Carl Milovanovich. The coroner's court sitting at Toronto heard the night before he was found drowned, Mr Bradford had been arrested by police after being caught trespassing in a construction zone on the Five Islands Bridge. Investigating police told the magistrate that after Mr Bradford was released from custody, the arresting officers returned the 52-year-old to the bridge about midnight to collect his bike, where he declined a lift home. The police then left the scene. Detective Chief Inspector Wayne Humphrey told the court he could find no evidence to suggest any other person was involved in Ian Bradford's death and he probably died accidentally. Mr Humphrey believes the fact Mr Bradford was battling bowel cancer, had a long history as a drug user and possibly even the cold water were also contributing factors. This afternoon, the coroner and assisting counsel toured the area near Cockle Creek where Mr Bradford was found. Of course, the site is different to in 2006 when the twin bridge was being built, but the tour only aims to familiarise the magistrate with the area. The inquest continues tomorrow. Penny Evans, NBN News. That will enable them to do more navigational exercises at the unit where they parade and also more field activities. First Perth, then Newcastle. Tom Samani's mission is to get to as many W League games as possible to poach players who, without the new women's competition, might have gone unnoticed. It's good to see you know, some up-and-coming players and some fringe players you know, put their wits against our established players like Cheryl Salisbury and Joey Peters. The likes of which play for the Newcastle Jets and in a physical display at the weekend contained Canberra with an entertaining brand of football, proving, for now at least, the critics wrong. Games have been exciting, there's been goals, quality of the football has been excellent uh, and there's been good crowds. 1,100 turned out to watch the Jets beat Canberra, a match Katie Gill almost didn't make and for Newcastle, thank goodness she did. Playing in Sweden recently, Gil arrived just hours before kickoff, but went on to score a double. I'm exhausted, to be honest. Um, I wouldn't recommend coming off a 22-hour flight and then going on the field, but no, it was really, it's really good to be back home. Gil is no doubt part of Samani's plan as he rebuilds the Matildas leading up to World Cup qualifiers in May 2010. Since the World Cup last year, you know, we've had some retirements and, and some players going on to do other things. Um, so the, and there are many spots up for grabs and we are redeveloping the team in a lot of senses. Starting with so much promise, Nick Flanagan couldn't finish the weekend off, ending it at two under. His second round, 67, was the best of the four days and needs plenty more of these at the final two events in Florida or it's back to qualifying school. 
At the FINA World Cup event in Sydney, Newcastle swimmer and AIS-bound athlete Thomas Fraser-Holmes finished the 400 individual medley a painful fourth, just 0.21 of a second from claiming silver. In the 100 metre backstroke final, Ashton Field, Stephanie Williams finished fifth. A confidence boost for Merriweather surfer Philippa Anderson in the lead up to December's Aussie titles. In yesterday's Teenage Rampage Junior Series at Bar Beach, Anderson won the under 16 girls but won't have it so easy at national level. It's going to be pretty hard because I'm in the under 18s this year and last year I got first in 16 so I'm hoping to you know, at least get his final. Surfing at his home break, sharing it with the locals. Jake Sylvester was runner up in the boys, locked in a real battle with Berkeley Vale's Shane Holmes who finished first. Both have qualified for the Teenage Rampage International at Curl Curl in December. Yeah, I was down there last year, but um, I was, had a pretty bad result down there, so um, I'd love to go down this year and um, have a good go at it. Nowhere near feeling the heat, Nathan Sinclair was unchallenged in the first of two finals, winning both the National Light and Heavy titles on his home track. It's the first time we've run it, so um, never finished second and third before, so it's really good for us. At the Newcastle Kart Club's biggest meeting of the year, this is what people came to see, with Quarrabalong 14-year-old Blake Waters pushed all the way, literally. Slipping back to second at times, Waters finished the 15 laps in front to win the junior light final. There's lots of pressure involved and it's like really hectic and we're, we're always fighting for the lead. Ten-year-old Josh Buggy from Canberra is always fighting, living with cerebral palsy and spina bifida. Much like his machine, he needs a lot of work just to compete, made possible by a committed family. To get Joshua out there, he's on constant painkillers, um, a lot of physio, massages and, and stuff like that. So it's a massive effort just to get him in the go-kart. He did play soccer once, but that became too much. Yet with the surname Buggy and two state titles already, motorsport is what motivates. I sort of want to be like Garth Tander or Mark Scaife. And in winning the midget class, he's well on the way.
Thomas Riley is the apple of his parents' eyes. The three and a half kilogram baby came into the world two days ago. I love him to death, even though he's a squawker. Noisy little thing already. Yeah, but no, we're just overjoyed. Seriously happy. Yeah, it's the boost we needed to keep going. But the joyful event of his birth was touched by sadness. In 2004, the Campbells lost their daughters, nine-year-old Rebecca and eight-year-old Jessica, along with their grandmother, Barbara Cheadle, in a horrific car accident at Bulladila. Obviously, it'd be nice if we had mum and the girls here to see all this. Um, but, yeah, it wasn't meant to be. Yeah. While Thomas won't ever meet his two sisters, they'll be a big part of his life, with the Campbell's house adorned with their photographs and full of memories. But I'm pretty sure they're here looking after him, so, yeah, I'll always be here looking after him. Kath and Greg had been trying to get pregnant through IVF for two and a half years before Thomas was conceived. His arrival has given them something to finally smile about. He's our little miracle baby. Madeleine Bond, NBN News. The high cost of fuel is affecting the amount of money we're putting into superannuation and savings, as well as how much we're spending on holidays, according to the latest study conducted by the Hunter Valley Research Foundation. 80% of the 300 Hunter residents surveyed last month said the high price is negatively affecting their lives, but 3% said it was a good thing. Well, one gentleman mentioned that he walked more as a result of increasing petrol prices, and so there was health benefits. During the study, people were asked what they'd do if petrol reached $2 a litre. 67% of Hunter residents said they would walk more. Another 65% of people said they'd consider buying a more fuel-efficient car. But motorists aren't the only ones suffering at the pump, with some petrol station owners also feeling the heat. Independents are really doing it tough. You've only got to look at the marketplace and have a look at the sites that have actually closed. Just in the last couple of years, again, there's been probably a 10% closure rate. Madeline Bond, NBN News. After writing off millions of dollars in profit last financial year through the cost of demutualising, Health Fund NIB isn't boasting the healthiest of bottom lines. So when passionate investors turned up for today's AGM in Newcastle, million dollar bonuses for board members were at the top of their concerns. It's all this greed that uh, they want so much money. Utterly, utterly ridiculous. Standing to gain the most, Managing Director and CEO Mark Fitzgibbon, with a boost from $774,000 last year to $2.3 million this year due to bonuses. I feel it's being run purely for the CEO. We weren't allowed to stay in the meeting with our camera, but debate about the board's pay rise was fierce. One shareholder called for the entire board to be sacked, while many people simply thought that $2.3 million for the CEO in one year was too much. 
But despite that concern voiced by those at the meeting, the package was passed late this afternoon based on the number of proxy votes in favour of the pay rises, which takes the total executive salary bill from $4 million to over $10 million. The gathering was told by Chairman Keith Lynch that that was money well spent. I can understand people have got to be paid, otherwise you don't get the right people in the job, but let's not go overboard, eh? Paul Lobb, NBN News. What a difference a week makes. The buoyant mood at Jets training has turned to frustration following the loss to the Mariners, but the boss isn't panicking. I'll take that any time of the week rather than uh, people just thinking that that was just good enough. The speculation surrounding the future of several players at the club is proving to be another unwanted distraction. Gary Van Egmond more concerned with the team's inability to find the back of the net so far this season. It was fairly evident this morning that people are not changing their runs, so we've just been walking through that, trying to make people aware of where they need to go in, in regards to when the ball's being delivered and obviously the quality of the cross that's coming in as well. The coach isn't expected to make wholesale changes for the clash with Queensland on Sunday. It's fairly early uh, in the week, so uh, we'll wait and see um, how the boys train. We've got a few ideas. Obviously, Queensland uh, are going to be uh, up for the game. Meanwhile, club officials admit it's likely some of their players are talking to rival clubs, but say re-signing Adam Griffiths and Captain Jade North is still a priority. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. For a side containing seven teenagers, the W League provides a steep learning curve. This week's trip to Hindmarsh Stadium in Adelaide, just another step towards professionalism. It's experience, you know, the, the travel, that we've got to get a bus to Sydney on Friday, we need to catch a flight. They're excited, you know, and I just hope that that excitement transfers onto the field. Despite the win over Canberra, the coach says there's room for improvement, especially with his team and star striker now better prepared. Last night I had a good night's sleep and was in the gym yesterday morning just ticking my legs over. So it's just back in the routine, which is good. Having played in front of big crowds before, 21-year-old Gill isn't likely to be overwhelmed but knows it could be a different story for her teenage teammates. You go out there, you can block it out or you can choose to let it affect you and I think experience will be good and I think some of the older girls will be good for the younger girls this week. One of those experienced players is Australian captain Cheryl Salisbury who took no prisoners on Sunday. She wants to win and she's a winner and as, as a career indicates, she's because of that attitude and that commitment, um, she wants to lead this team by example. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.
While it looks like fun and games, the lessons taught in this mobile classroom could save lives. These Year 10 Rutherford Technology High School students are on the verge of getting their driving licences, but until today had little idea about how risky sharing the road with big rigs can be. They don't realise how much space a truck does need to turn, that it does require both lanes um, in order to clear the trailer from the curbs. So they tend to take the risk of trying to overtake. The travelling exhibition centre called The Road Ahead is giving students information like how much room heavy vehicles need. The modified semi-trailer cost $1.3 million to build and is travelling to schools and transport industry orientated shows across the country. Teachers are singing the program's praises. The students gather a lot of information about the type of um, careers within the transport industry, while at the same time learning some safety tips, how to overtake a truck, how simple things can turn into disaster. Anyone who wants to take a peek inside the rig can do so on Sunday at the Newcastle Foreshore. Madeline Bond, NBN News. The state government has already approved Rose Group's plan to build a new housing estate next to the old mining village. But if it's to get the go-ahead, the federal government must also sign off on the plan because the site is home to the tiny pink flower Tetratheca juncia or black-eyed Susan. Experts say the plant is extremely rare in New South Wales but is found in good numbers around Catherine Hill Bay. So some locals are hoping the tiny flower will pack a punch when it comes to the minister's final decision. Any area that has federally threatened species has to be uh, referred to the, um, the, the federal government. So there is still a process that the federal government has to do to approve it even after the state has approved it. And we're, we're in that process now and we're still extremely hopeful that Peter Garrett's office will, um, will stop this development. Minister Garrett last week chose not to exercise his emergency powers to list Catherine Hill Bay on the National Heritage Register, choosing instead to follow the environmental process already in place. Paul Lobb, NBN News. In 1828, surveyor Sir Thomas Mitchell was busy making topographical drawings of the colony at Newcastle. Regarded as highly accurate, the drawings recorded a view of Nobbies before the top of the one-time island was cut off. During a recent study of the drawings, it was noticed that he recorded another name for the landmark. We've found a, a, the first recorded mention of the original name for Nobbies. It was known as Wybaganba. The exact meaning isn't clear, but it's believed to be related to a shout or warning, possibly because of the unstable rocks around its cliff face. A dreaming story about Nobbies tells of a kangaroo that was imprisoned in the headland, which would occasionally thump its tail, causing rocks to fall. As a result of the find, members of the Coal River Working Group, based at the University of Newcastle, have made an application to the Geographical Names Board to give the headland the dual name of Nobby's Wybaganba. It pays respect to our Aboriginal brothers and sisters, and it also deepens our experience. You know, people think we're only 200 years old. We're thousands and thousands of years old. The human story, if you dig deep enough, you will find it, and, um, and hopefully be inspired by it, whether it is of Aboriginal dream time or... Other. Paul Lobb, NBN News.
I think it does probably just a, a little bit of pressure but um, you know I think hopefully we'll have the advantage playing in front of our home crowds. Ranging from 29 to 50 years old, this is one of the most dedicated group of athletes you'll ever meet. 47-year-old mother of two, Catherine Blanche, is now ranked third in Australia in one of natural bodybuilding's toughest disciplines. Exercise is never far from her mind. Just being very conscious about what I do around the house, actually doing housework and running up and down the stairs are all great exercises for mums to do. Mother of three, Jenny Wickham, took out her second Ultra Grand Masters title, while fellow mum, Justine Roberts, claimed second in the novice figure division. Under the guidance of coach Michael Barrett, the girls took the Nationals by storm. In six months, the amount of muscle that Michael has been able to help me develop has been phenomenal, and I'm looking forward to continuing training with him and getting better. Nicknamed Guns, Zoe took out the Women's Masters title and was narrowly beaten by the world champion for the overall crown. Once you're there, you've made the commitment to do it, just get out there and have some fun. And that's what I try to do when I get out there is like, OK, these are my muscles, check them out. The girls will now turn their attention to the Asia Pacific Championships on the Gold Coast in May. I'm actually looking forward to getting older and looking better next year. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. It's not an impossible task, but Nick Flanagan needs a form reversal if he's to sneak into the USPGA's top 125. He says he's enjoying the tour experience, even though his game has suffered. I just haven't been hitting the ball very well this year, and um, it's just been a bit of a... I've played more golf this year than I've played uh, in my entire career, so it's just been a bit of an adjustment, and um, I haven't quite uh, got the hang of it. He's made the cut at several tournaments, but Flanagan has never fired during the final round. His effort in Milwaukee summed up his tour. First, with 18 holes to play, he stumbled into a tie for 11th. You put more and more pressure on yourself and you, uh, you end up trying a little too hard and going in the opposite direction. Fellow Lake Macquarie golfer Nathan Green hasn't had the best year by his standards, but his influence has been invaluable. He's taught me a lot. He's probably one of my best buddies out there. I spend most, most of my weeks, most dinners at night time with him and his wife and uh, we, we're in contact a lot. If he does automatically retain his card, Flanagan will fly home for a much needed break and may compete in a handful of Australia's summer tournaments. If he misses out, he faces a stint at qualifying school and the prospect of dropping back to the nationwide tour. I'm going to have a place to play for a long time. It's just a matter of whether it's going to be on the uh, nationwide or the main tour uh, the next couple of years. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. This is our first glimpse inside the New Look Royal, a display suite enticing advance purchasers to snap up 60 of the 146 Stage 1 apartments in a private offering last weekend. We had very strong interest from people living in the Hunter region, but particularly of, of interest we had uh, expatriates looking back into the Newcastle region. In a sombre economic climate, it's a better than expected start to selling for developer Mervac. This represents that there's underlying confidence in quality real estate. It shows the confidence in the Hunter region as a growing region. The $375 million project opens to the public on Saturday and Mervac is hoping its early sales success will continue. 
From the display rooms, you can see the iconic beachside site under transformation. It's on schedule for a 2010 Stage 1 completion. There's machines in the ground and they're working away and we expect that the structure in the early part of next year will start to come out of the ground. Prices for one-bedroom apartments start at $345,000. As for the penthouses, well, Mervex aiming for the sky. Copper has become hot property. It's worth around $9,000 a tonne and is in high demand at scrap metal yards. Since the start of last year, thieves have targeted numerous locations around the Hunter in search of the base metal. Downpipes were stolen from Newcastle's Christchurch Cathedral and Belmont High School, while just last month, copper wire was taken from underneath Newcastle's new maritime centre. But selling stolen copper is getting harder. Datadot has created a microscopic security device that can be sprayed onto items. It's on there for good for the life of the product. Um, so once the item's sprayed we can then identify it back to the location it was sprayed. So therefore we, we know exactly who the owner is. Digital scanners are used to read the sprayed on nanoparticles. Two weeks ago the product helped police. Recently there was a theft uh, from a Maitland uh, sub-terminal uh, and we were able to identify the, the copper that was stolen from there. Datadot says some companies are claiming a 90% drop in theft, but the technology doesn't come cheap. It can cost anywhere from $20,000 to $1 million. Madeline Bond, NBN News. These children and their families lost their homes and school a year ago when a massive cyclone and flood swept through Oro province. These pictures, taken just weeks ago, show the Imbogo boarding school north of Kokoda. This was the main dormitory and sanitation and fresh water remained cut off. Local families sleep beneath makeshift shelters. But a Newcastle-based group of plumbers will fly out to PNG this weekend to help repair the damage. They lost everything, um, all of their housing, uh, fairly primitive though it was, it was gone. Um, the school itself was extensively damaged. Uh, some of the buildings still remain, but um, a lot of the infrastructure was washed away. So the kids have actually just gone back um, to their villages and for the last 12 months they've received no education. The joint venture between Mullane Plumbers and the Rotary Club will see seven plumbers and a fitter and turner carrying everything they need on their backs, including tools, plumbing materials, donated clothes and even 150 caps for the local kids donated by the Newcastle Knights. 
Fitter and Turner is going to come in very handy with some of the machinery requirements. They've got no power at the moment, their generator's down, so we're hoping Andrew will be able to fix that for us. The plumbers primarily will try and get the water supply going. If we can get the infrastructure right with the guys going over getting fresh water in um, and getting the mud and the, the general stuff cleaned up, then we, through our contacts with Rotary we should be able to get some textbooks and some material to get it up as a proper school. Paul Lobb, NBN News. Described as a coming-of-age film set in Newcastle's surf culture, local audiences will feel right at home. The young cast of mostly Sydney actors walked the red carpet in Newcastle last night along with US-based director Dan Castle. Well, it's basically a journey home for a character named Jesse, who never leaves home, but he discovers this wonderful place he lives while in the process of the week before Surf Fest. And he thinks he's not going to get in, then he gets in, but in between there's a tragedy that he has to face up to. The film has already become a springboard for some fledgling acting careers. Got a few of us um, uh, a footstep into uh, uh, LA, which is fantastic. Got agents over there. I, I just did a film from America, which is really cool. The movie was shot around Newcastle, Port Stephens and Lake Macquarie last year. In terms of how the actual um, scenery and, and the beaches and Stockton and the dunes and, and it's all depicted, I think they'll love it. There's some awesome cinematography in the film and good surfing and yeah. Newcastle opens around Australia next week. Paul Lobb, NBN News. The move to Newcastle is a chance for a new beginning for Isaac de Goyce, Ben Rogers, George Nadera and Jim Fawcett. So far, the recruits seem impressed. Had a bit of a look around and a bit of a sort of tour thing today and everyone seems very friendly. For Nadera, the Knights represent his fourth club in four years, but his first outside Sydney. Living with one of the boys, uh, Chris Houston, so that should be good, you know, make the transition a bit easier. And I know a few of them already, I've played with them, you know, when I was a bit younger and that. So, you know, not too daunting, it should be good to get out of home and, uh, you know, enjoy the lifestyle up here. He's hoping to challenge De Goyce and Matt Hilda for the hooking role. Try there and whatever else happens, happens, but, you know, try my hardest in pre-season and in the trials and all that. and put my hand up and go from there. Rogers will push for a spot in the halves but knows he'll have a tough time competing with the likes of Mullen, Duro and Walsh. My position would be sort of 5'8". I could play a bit of lock. So I've ventured all over the place over the past, say, two years. I've been to a few clubs and it'll be, be nice to settle down up here. The recruits will join their new teammates at the first official gathering on Monday. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News. As the old saying goes, if at first you don't succeed, try and try again. Gary Van Egmond says his side has shown flashes of quality this season, but a lack of goals is clearly cause for concern and plenty of practice. What we need to do is, is step that up and convert the good play and convert the possession and convert the amount of chances or crosses that we've created into goals. Tariq Elrich knows all about scoring against the Raw, claiming a spectacular winner in last year's semi-final. I love scoring against Liam Reddy, you know, being an ex-teammate and stuff, so hopefully um, I've got another one in me. Van Egmond is expecting his stars to fire this weekend, believing Joel Griffiths and Mark Milligan will be stronger after the run against the Central Coast. It's all about getting your rhythm as a player, uh, week in, week out of football, and, um, you know, there's been a few interruptions here and there. Meanwhile, Adam Griffiths missed today's session because of a head cold and will be monitored in the lead-up to Sunday's game. No luck for Noel Spencer either. He's likely to undergo surgery on his injured ankle. If Spencer is ruled out, Daniel Piorkowski could earn an extended stay at the club as his temporary replacement. Mitchell Hughes, NBN News.